tonight. Ruth Fahey is here. Good morning to you. Good morning. How are you? I'm pretty good. This, um, this sounds like it's a bit of a revenge mission for the Dutch, even though it was a draw the last time. Yeah, right. which is kind of frightening because you don't want the Dutch coming here looking for a revenge. Um, but it certainly is. In the nil all draw last November, the Dutch had an inordinate amount of possession. It was very much backs against the wall. Not only that, but they felt so aggrieved because in the final couple of minutes there was possibly the most clear handball I've ever seen right. um, and the ref didn't give it yeah. so after the game the Dutch players are all around the ref going absolutely crazy and um, so yeah as, as Bell mentioned there that they're, they're out for revenge and he thinks they're looking for 6-7 and even in the game they played Northern Ireland last Friday they beat them 7-0 in right. front of a crowd of over 30,000 so they're very much ready to go but uh Oh, Bell will have this, these players so drilled and so organised. Um, they're not going to be easy to break down by any means. This qualification campaign is um, the winner goes through automatically. Yeah. And then four of the best placed second teams get into playoffs. Exactly. So it's kind of different. So the seven groups. Um, so even if you come runner up, you're not guaranteed to get through. Like you say, it's the four best go into the playoffs where it's actually a home and away leg and then into the final, a home and away leg. So it's quite... A, you know what it is? It's a real arduous journey to get there. So hang on, there's two, there's two playoffs? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. So, like, Bell, realistically, when he saw this group, he would have said, we'll be doing well to come second. Right. Um, all the hullabaloo is based on the fact that we're still very much in with a chance coming first. There's the group, which is, there's the group table there. Yeah, so. there we go. So, as you can see at this stage, like, that's incredible to be up there and jo joint with the Netherlands. Obviously, goal difference is fa fairly different, but joint on points is incredible. Um, ahead of Norway, so... If we can get a result tonight, that puts us in a massive position in terms of... And by result, I mean, if we can get a draw tonight, yeah. that would be incredible. Um, because really, you're looking at competing with Norway for second place there. And Norway, to be fair, are no easy feat either. They played the Netherlands last year. It went... I think it went right up to the wire, and the Netherlands beat, just about beat them 1-0. I was looking at the possession stats today. Netherlands had about 56 and Norway 44, so it was very much an even game. So it's not as if we're just going to go run over Norway either. So yeah. like Colin Bell has been saying that over and over, that look, we're in a great position and the hype is excellent, but this is an unbelievably tough group. Um, but it's very much one game at a time, and tonight, yeah, it's going to be incredible. It's going to be back to the walls. I don't want to say parking the bus. Um, at the same time, last November Ireland had four brilliant chances right. so on the counter like it's yeah. very possible to score as well so anything can happen the main thing is to keep them out initially but like the Dutch have incredible players I'm, I'm obviously really excited about the game but I'm so excited to see the Dutch live like they're unbelievable athletes as well there's somebody who just joined Barca last yeah. November yeah who's <laughs> yeah, she? That, that's Lika Martins um, she's the reigning uh, European player of the year FIFA best player of the year I was actually just reading about her there just looking at her pictures with Messi and Ronaldo like she's she's possibly the best player at the moment in women's football. Um, she plays in the left wing and the Irish girls actually kept her relatively quiet last time, which is great. Yeah, we can see here, got between, there's like Lika Martins, Vivian Miedema, 21 year old number nine there. She's an incredible striker. Uh, Van de Sanden, number seven, she is a danger right winger. So Lika Martins is there in the left, number 11. Between Martins and Sanden, Sanden play, Van de Sanden plays for Leon, who right. are the reigning European, er, Champions League winners, so like we're looking at full-time professionals who are celebrities in the Netherlands. Um, it's just a massive test, but the girls showed last November that they're capable. And like I said, they had four brilliant chances with Amber Barrett in the first half, where the Dutch just didn't really expect the Irish to come out like that. And um, you can see by their results, like beating Northern Ireland seven nil. Yeah, you know, they crush teams. Yeah, they, they crush teams. Like they go out and crush them, and they tried so many different variations, like usually they crush teams on the flanks, so between Martins on the left and Van der Sanden on the right, they always have a huge look. If that doesn't work, Vivian Miedema in the centre, she's 21, she's played 63 times already for right. the senior side, scored, quite scored yeah, it's quite a lot, and scored 50 goals, so it's outrageous, she, she plays for Arsenal. Um, but like, Bell just had this exceptional defensive setup, and they couldn't get through them. Um, so the thing is, the Dutch know what to expect tonight and they will have come up with ways to penetrate the defence this time. So it'll be just really interesting to see are the Irish going to be able to adapt as well when the Dutch try something different. But when so it comes to someone like Van der Sanden, like Harriet Scott did a really good job in her last time, yeah. who's obviously missing tonight. So yeah. like, is that the only big worry we have in terms of team selection or does it just become such a systemic thing where it doesn't matter who's playing, that Colin Bell will have them set up in such a way that, like, as I say, it, it, that the personnel is going to be to a certain extent kind of elementary when it comes to this Dutch team? 
Um, that's a good question. I think yes and no. So basically, against Slovakia, that was the question: was who's going to come in? Because Harry Harry Scott did such a good job against Van Sand and surprisingly for me, I actually didn't expect. But Karen Duggan came in at left full, and um, she ended up getting player of the match, and she was brilliant. I think putting Karen Duggan in there will work. I don't think he could just put anyone in there because you're talking about the caliber of these players. It's so high that, it, like, say, if you put in another player who was not adaptable and not versatile enough, they would be absolutely ruined. Sure. So it's not, it's not a case where he has a personnel set up the system and go. He does need the quality as well. And um, he's very fortunate to have someone like Karen Duggan who can actually go in there and do that job. Um, it's really, really unfortunate that Anya Gorman's not fit. We still don't know really what, what the problem is there, but she's apparently not going to be playing tonight, which is a real pity, because um, she's someone like Duggan who's really versatile. He can put her around the pitch, but yeah, he's, he's obviously got them so drilled. They obviously really respect him, but he definitely needs certain quality as well. So you can't just throw them in there and say, look, deal with this Leon star um, or, or such. So... Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. I'm actually just really nervous about the match. <laughs> I'm just really excited about it as well. I can't wait to see the Dutch players live. Is it nervous in the sense that you hope Ireland don't get killed? Uh, yes, to be honest, yeah. I do hope that. I'm nervous for the girls. I know some of the players. Um, the hype has been incredible coming up to this game. It's been more than I've ever, ex ever seen, ever. Um, it's like the biggest... Uh, without putting pressure on them, it is the biggest game in women's football history. Um, the fact is... I'm expecting a 5,000 capacity crowd as well. I really think that that's what's going to happen. I'm nervous because just the quality that they're playing. I know they've done it already, but they were going there with not a hope. There's not a hope, and now the hype is all around. They've shown they can get a result against the European champions. I'm nervous because I'm worried the expectation might break them a little bit. I hope it won't. I think Bell will prepare them that it won't. Yeah. Um, yeah, I am nervous about that. I'm a bit nervous about I, that. I guess it helps as well when you look at the kind of the way the fixtures now pan out because what you've got there, being realistic, should the Netherlands win tonight, you've got a fascinating kind of mini group there between Ireland uh, and Norway and Northern Ireland. Yeah. So what that ultimately gains the Irish team is after tonight and after the hype, after the capacity crowd, is hopefully a support group that'll carry into the Norway game, which mm -hmm. being realistic could subsequently become the biggest game in yeah. Irish women's football history after this and getting to that playoffs because it becomes a journey then. You've already outlined how complicated the playoffs process is and the amount of games that is. So it's, it is a blessing having the Netherlands game now because it can kickstart a real movement. I actually don't think it could have fallen more perfectly, to mm. be honest, for Bell's side, only because they got that result against the Dutch last, last year because you're right, it does set up perfectly because if they lose tonight, Grand, but they've gathered that momentum now. Um, if the crowd, I hope, turns up, they'll stay with the girls then for the June double header. And it actually works really well when they come against Norway. It's two back to back games similar to this week, it's a week apart. So the crowd will stay, the interest will stay. Um, I, th I actually think you're spot on there. I think like it's just worked out so well. Like I said, the hype has been outrageous. I can't, I can't believe it. And I hope the girls can actually use that to get a result tonight. But yeah. Um, I just want to play you this. This is Colin Bell speaking on the show last night about the issues that the team had a year ago and what impact that's had. Have a look. So far, so good. It's been a really positive year. I mean, first year in charge for you, to say the least, and to be joint top with the Netherlands at this stage of the group, I'm sure, is uh, massively pleasing for everyone. You must have been uh, slightly concerned when you arrived just over a year ago and the team were in the midst of... Uh, that very high profile situation at Liberty Hall holding a press conference making what seemed certainly on the outside like some fairly basic demands I'm sure you were thinking what's going on here yeah you know that was a bit of a, a surprise maybe I was aware of certain things but you know I honestly said at the time that the first step that the FAI took going into that uh, direction of listening uh, to the players uh, concerns and uh, showing their intent that they want to build the women's uh, game in Ireland was to appoint a head coach who's full-time. Mm. First time ever in, in the history of the FAI. So that was a big step. And I think that got lost a little bit in all these things. But um, in end effect, uh, you know, everybody got themselves sorted. The girls and the FAI got together. Um, they have a good deal, good package. Uh, and, you know, so... Um, fortunately for both parties, uh, it was a, it was a good thing to get out of the way um, and to, you know just to move the game forward. Mm. The girls have reacted very well. The FAI have reacted very well. Um, so you know, I know it's like a, an anniversary now, a year ago, 
But, um, you know, I haven't obviously thought about this. Uh, you know, I, I know what happened at that time. We looked ahead and, and I concentrate on what's going on the pitch. And, uh, you know, things have, have moved well for us. I mean, obviously, he can't go. Oh, the FBI, <laughs> oh, the players. He's yeah. He's got to try and uh, yeah. tread that balance, and he's done a, a very cautious and political job of it very well. And he the has, results yeah. have been really yeah. good, so that kind of helps. But what's the truth? What's what? Like, do, do have things improved enough? From speaking to the players, they've improved dramatically, um, significantly, and they've really felt the change, and it's really helped them in their lifestyles. Have things improved enough? I think it's going to take a couple of years for that to filter down. It's not going to be a sudden thing. Has it improved? Yes, 100%. As you said, Bell did an unbelievable political job. He was put in a really tough position yeah. there. Um, but I think the players were quite good and that they really kept him out of it. He'd just come into the role. In terms of, if you think about it, the girls were taking time off work um, to go and play. So they're losing money that way, weren't getting any allowance. We, we know the whole... Uh, thing about the tracksuits, whatever. It wasn't even that. It was just about having the foundations to make them better. You could see Bell there said it's about moving moving it forward. And yeah, it, 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 that will take years to trickle down because it's about the younger girls. And, I, and I, remember, I remember a year ago writing an article about this. It's kind of about the younger generation looking at that and saying, I can not only play for Green Jerseys, but you know, I can get paid for this and, and I don't have to make certain sacrifices. So it's definitely better, definitely better. And it's only going to get better and get better. Yes, the biggest um, determinant of whether it's better or not is if they, if and when they qualify for a major tournament and the fact that we're still in the running is, is massive, so yeah. Um, I, I'm interested in, in this team and how many of them have played at, um, so there was an underage tournament that Ireland did well at a couple of years back. Yeah. There yeah. was an under 18s. That it was, I think, was, was it under 17s? under 17s? It was in Trinidad and Tobago, the World Cup. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of what year that was. 2010, uh, so I think it was 2010. Out of this squad who are remaining... So not that many. Not either. that many. Um, I'm trying to think it was Katie McCabe and that there was a certain core who were with the senior squad up until about two or three years ago. A couple still playing in the Women's National League. Um, the likes of Rihanna Jarrett, Emma Hansbury, played with Wexford Youths. Katie McCabe Sean was Killeen. and Claire Shine was. Yeah, exactly. So Claire Shine still with Cork. Katie McCabe obviously now is the captain of Ireland. Um, they've lost an awful lot of them. Uh, in terms of at International 11, I think Jess Leeson is at Shelburne now. So they're still very much involved in terms of still with the senior squad. They're actually not far away. Some of them are very much in there, of course, but um, still involved. But yeah, they've lost a good few But it hasn't way. been a straightforward, like the, the pathway, the talent pathway um, has, has been a, an issue in the past because yeah. we obviously don't have our own professional league. Yeah. And um, you went to American Scholarship, is that right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So like clearly um, the opportunity for women's football in America is huge. You mm. go, you get an education, it's life-changing experience. Um, and it, it's balancing that with coming back to play for Ireland and, yeah, and how true. that system works or trying to find full-time professional employment with one of the European clubs, while yeah. at the same time hoping that the domestic league can improve to a point where something sustainable <laughs> can exist here. It's very much a catch-22. I actually forgot to mention Denise O'Sullivan. I think she was involved too, and she's a star player now. She plays pro in the States. Um, it's catch-22, right, because I'm, I love the Women's National League. I've been involved since its inception in 2011, and I want to see it get better and better. And we've seen it go, go up and down the last couple of years because players have gone. The likes of Kelly McCabe has gone, Denise O'Sullivan has gone. The league has actually weakened a little bit. Although it's getting bigger in terms of numbers, the quality went down slightly for a stage. The biggest problem with the development pathway in Ireland is it goes under 17, under 19 and straight to senior. So we don't catch that in between. There's no under 21, there's no under 23. So say with the lads, it's the under 21. So that time in between, some players go to college in the States, it's happened loads, don't make the transition back for whatever reason. Um, in the States, you make your decision, you're either getting drafted, you're at the top or you're gone. So that's where that mentality comes from. Some come back and play in the league, not, everyone, not all of them do. So we are actually losing a pool there in that section, which is, yeah, it's frightening. I think that's one of the things that obviously the FEI, I'm sure they're looking at it. Um, it it's, I would hope that they're looking at it. Shouldn't you be encouraging people to go and say and come back? Because like, it, it definitely, talking to people over the years, it was yeah. like, oh, Jesus, the Yanks are coming over here and stealing all our talent. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, but they're offering like educations which are yeah. up there with the best in the world and it's a massive opportunity. So encourage people yeah. to go, but make sure there's like a straight, we will, we will welcome you back yeah, as opposed to, exactly. you know, you're done, that's it now. 
Well, not everyone wants to go either as well, so there has to be an option there for those that don't want to go to have as similar as possible set up in Ireland. So ha obviously, in terms of finances, there is no money here to offer the, the same scholarship or whatever, but yeah. there has to be some, like, we could do better. We could yeah. definitely do better in that sense. I would recommend people if the opportunity comes and they're good enough, and if it's a, a Division One college or a top college, to go, because you're right, it's an unbelievable opportunity. Full scholarships everywhere on offer. Um, you get treated Ridiculous like a professional. Like so, yeah, you're, yeah. Literally, you're literally playing like a pro. Like we were training every day, matches twice a week. Um, college, everything was kind of structured around you as a player. You were getting, given so much assistance. Yeah. So for some people, it'll suit them extremely well. But yeah, some people don't want to go. And for them, that's we well, have spoken about this before. For them, they need a bit more help, a bit more of a helping hand, and uh, even just advice or even, you know, academics is not always people's strong point, but that college system can also build a player to get back into senior squad. And when there is that lack of under 21 or under 23, there needs kind of something else that people need a, need a little bit of help with. Yeah. But the college system over the States is so good. And but the likes of, for example, Megan Con Connolly is Florida State University. I think she's coming to her final years. We want to bring her back now, but she's too good at the moment to come back to our National League. So Megan Campbell was Florida State and now she's playing with Man City. Right. So even keeping them close by <laughs> would yeah. be nice in that kind of sense. But so that's up to our league to catch up. So they want to play there. And just uh, pardon my ignorance, but would you make more money playing football as a pro when you leave college in the States or in the UK or in Europe? Or so when you finish college yeah. at that stage. Um, just to be honest, much for muchness because you're not making huge amounts of money. Like in, so in the UK, in the Women's Super League, I think the top players there would be on uh, like 70 grand sterling, right? So I was actually reading the Times this morning, um, Lika Martins is reportedly on 180 grand right. with Barcelona. Yeah. So in Europe now, I think the money, there is money there to be made. Like you're making six figures as a pro. Yeah. That's an awful happy long days. way from where, yeah, happy days. Like I'd take that, anyone would take that. The States, uh, I think will be more online with the UK salaries, but then the sponsorship and all that. So. Yeah. Yeah, you can make a decent living, yeah. Yeah, like pretty much, yeah. So the, the European leagues would actually be a really yeah. good route back for Irish internationals who then, you know, 100%. can be scouted properly by Colin Bell and, yeah. and, and touch the FAI. Yeah, you're looking at top clubs, like like I said, Lyon, Barcelona. Um, the, in the UK, like the Women's Super League has gone from strength to strength. They're going fully professional now. There's a new policy. That it's only recent, actually, that they switched to that. The UK? That, yeah, in the yeah. UK, yeah, that they have to be full-time pros. Um, so, in effect, the salaries will go up and up. So... Yeah, you can certainly make a living. I just, the Women's National League, literally we'd need a couple more hours to talk about it. There's so much more that can be done and needs so much more support. It's, I wouldn't say it's struggling, it was struggling and now it's kind of coming back into force. We've got, we've gone from seven up to eight teams this year. So Limerick have come in this year. But you've heard Colin Bell talk, he wants his players training more. He wants, be, he's very much, players need to train every day, right? Yeah. So he, it's very difficult for him because he's, cause he's got the domestic players completely amateur versus his pro players. He said there the gap is actually narrowing, which is good. So he's trying to build his senior squad, he's trying to bring up the under 17s and he's trying to make the league better as well. Yeah, so he's doing, a, he's doing an awful lot. Like it's, yeah. really, it's really tough. So you just need, you need more resources, more personnel, like the same old story. Is there a yeah. sign of a 21s or a 23s league coming down the tracks? Absolutely not, no, not, not at all. A league, is it? Yeah. No, there's an under 17 league starting this year. Um, there'll be a, a shortened league this year and then there'll be a full league next year. So. Bell has come in and he's he's looking at youth like he's looking at long term development. So he's managing the Irish under seventeen team. He's brought three of those into the senior squad, which be, like they're brilliant little players, which is great. And I'm sure he's helped set up the under seventeen league. But I think rather than under twenty one league, I think an under twenty one national team or even an Irish B team or something just to close that gap between nineteens and senior. Because um, I think you're just losing an awful lot there in between. Yeah. yeah. It seems like the natural progression, so say if talent was no question and you're the best footballer in Ireland, it seems like the best way of progressing is actually going to the States then. It's not actually going straight to Europe, it seems like go to the States, get your mm -hmm. education, because it seems like the developmental facilities there are better, and then it seems that they're so in touch, or Europe is so in touch with the best players with the US colleges that yeah. you will get your move. Yeah, if you want to go away, um, it's a perfect setup for you, because women's football, <laughs> They talk about in men's football how you should fall back in education. That's even more important in women's football because there's actually absolutely nothing guaranteed. So you should be using if, the football to get your education. Yeah, 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 like yeah, the, yeah exactly. Flipped in on the inverse. Yeah, you can use it. Like that's what I did. I was offered, you know, full scholarship. Just yeah, use it, use it to go. And I use it for the experience. Like it, it was great to go. So 
you see, I, I don't want to agree fully with you there because then they're all going to go and leave the na National League, so that's, that's not what I want. But if the opportunity comes knocking for someone who's just done their leaving cert to go, and they do want to go, it's, it's an awful, you know, it's a very uh, frightening thing to go all the way to the States for four years, possibly by yourself. Um, so lots of people don't want to go, but if the opportunity's there, you want to go. Yeah, if you're going to a top college, I would say that, like the example of Florida State, top, top college, they're being drafted into the Pro League. Um, yeah, that'll make you a great player. We can always come back to our lovely little National League, which is hopefully getting better and better, yeah. Yeah, it's finding that, it's having a mature relationship with that system, yeah. as opposed to America bad, uh, Ireland yeah. good, you've got to stay here, and then people end up getting yeah. pissed off both but it's, it's right what you mentioned, it's about kind of bringing them back in when they want to come back. So the likes of Noelle Murray left last year to go play with Glasgow, for, uh, playing pro for a year. She's come back now this year, right? So for whatever reason, she's decided... Um, you know, she's had a professional time and she wants to come back, like get her back in and get her involved in the league. The, like, that's happened, like Claire Shine um, was abroad as well. She's come back in, back in the league. So you have to allow these players to go to play professionally. That's a dream many of them have since they're young. But if they want, if there's any sign they want to play in Ireland, keep them here and look yeah. after them. Yeah. That's the main thing, yeah. Yeah. I mean, centrally contracting a bunch of players to the FAI, yeah. obviously that takes a lot of money and suddenly, you know, it's a whole new ball game then. It is, yeah, but exactly. I mean that would that would revolutionise it if you'd uh, yeah, player, exactly. two players at each club who were full time yeah, professionals. That would be incredible. Even semi pro. There's been quite a bit of talk about that in recent times, but it hasn't come to anything. And I think it, another big thing, again, a discussion for another day, is that PFAI looks after obviously the men's side and the women's um, senior national team. There's absolutely nobody or nobody looking after the players of the women's national national league, so they're just completely because isolated. They're amateur. Is that Be why they exactly? Yes, yeah, sorry, because they're amateur. Right. Um, just, like it's just completely run by the FAI, and because it's so new and because there's so many issues with the other, like the League of Ireland and the First and Premier Division, it doesn't get it's very attention. much third tier. Yeah. yeah, it's it's something you get to if you can, yeah. if you can. But and that's the problem. It just needs somebody to take it and prioritize it or a body to look after or something. But yeah, something needs to be a little bit yeah. different. All right, so you're predicting uh, backs against the wall, park the bus, <laughs> raucous atmosphere tonight, yeah. and maybe they might just squeak a draw? Yeah. Be delighted with that? That's exactly, ex exactly how I would describe it, yeah.